Yes, my name is Jakob Ideskog and I work at Tuba Technologies with identity solutions and identity questions all day long. So I'm going to continue what David talked about here and, and try to apply some of these concepts uh, to real world problems. And the real world problem that I chose was microservices. And uh, we've had some talks about that already, which was more than I anticipated, but I'll, I'll give you sort of a a quick dive into what that is before I sort of dig into the, the standards instead. Uh, perhaps some of you missed the morning talk, who knows. So you have a, the traditional service anyway. We have a bunch of components in our services. Um, we want to build these components. We, we add them together and then we form a working system that deploys and that is our complete solution or our service that we deploy. This is the traditional way of building most any software that we have today. With it comes its ordinary problems. You have to build each component. You want to update a component, and you have to rebuild the entire system. You want to redeploy re a component, you have to redeploy the entire system. Downtime, maintenance times, uh, version control cycles, all of these things are tied together when we work with these traditional systems built out of components, but still um, delivered as a monolithic system. Scalability is pretty easy. We just take a bunch of them and then we deploy them next to each other. Um, the more we need, but it doesn't really help us anything uh, if, if it's one particular component that we need to scale more than others. We need to just redeploy the entire, or continuously deploy the entire system. Now, as it turns out, we've started to build systems differently than this. Um, obviously, as in software, it's not a new thing. It's been done over and over and over again. But now for the RESTful world, we start to build microservices instead. And microservices then, obviously, is we take one of these components, we deploy it independently of all other components, and let it live its own life. And that means we can deploy many of them next to each other. We can, we can run these systems uh, to form a full service for us. Um, but we're not, no longer dependent on deploying the whole thing at once. We can recompile a component, we can redeploy a component without taking down the entire service. And this is fairly interesting, I'm guessing, since we've had many talks on this already. Um, scaling, of course, becomes vastly easier. We can take the yellow component and we can deploy it as many times as we want on as many services as we want, and then we have scaled our solution to meet the demands it turned out to have, which can be hard to predict before. <coughs> so, what's the problem? Typically in a microservice, or in a traditional service, we secure it, or we need to find out who is the caller, what can the caller do, and how do we propagate that information. And that's usually done by providing some component in, in the beginning of the request chain or somewhere early on that populates the session object or the request object or whatever we use and passes it on further into the components that are being called during the request. Usually this also means that we need to pick up extra data belonging to that particular user and we do that either directly in the beginning or we let the components do that, but they share the state that comes in and they share this information and they share the access to the user repository in this, this example. So for a microservice, that would mean that we would put all of, each, each of these components would have its own request handler then that would also have to deal with the identity coming in. It would have to call the particular user repository to find the, the information that it would need to populate its object and then handle the request and go back <laughs> response. But if you chain these, obviously, they, then you have a lot of the same thing going on. So you have to have different paths depending on where it came from, who called it, where what information do you need, all of these things. So it's not really a fantastic solution when it comes to microservices to scale it like that. So before we dive into what I think we should do, I want to step back and talk a bit about OAuth. Um, I'm going to do it a bit more, more, more in depth, but not every arrow in the diagram. Um, but as David said, and this cannot be pointed out enough, is that OAuth is not for authentication, not for authorization. 
It's a complete delegation protocol and it's extremely scalable when it comes to delegation. So delegation is, I delegate access to someone to do something for me. And that's what it is. So that means that the one who provides the data could still refuse this. They could still say, no, I don't want to give you this data because I, I don't trust you. But the user has said, yeah, you can get the data. So there's, there's, that's the difference sort of between the authorization and the delegation. And we should probably go into that at some other talk. So OAuth has four actors. We have the resource owner, you, the user. We have the client, the app, typically, if we're in the mobile world. Um, the app backend, in some cases. We have the authorization server, which is the OWASP server. And we have the resource server, which is where stuff is stored, or stuff is available, the service that we want to use. So let's say that this resource server is a mail server, Gmail or some other mail server. And some smart dude wrote an app that has a sorts my emails differently, or lets me know that some email needs urgent attention, or something like that. So my app needs access to my email account on my email server, and I need to make that happen. So the first thing that happens is that the client requests access, the app requests access to the resource server by calling the authorization server. The authorization server says, sure, you can have access if the user authenticates. So the user, the, the authorization server will then redirect and let the user authenticate. Typically, this is done. This can be done in, in various ways, but typically, this is done by, by showing a browser um, with the address of the authorization server in it, so that the user is not really signing into the app; it's signing into the authorization server. And when that's done, the authorization server will will validate the credentials, obviously, and provide a token, and this is called an access token. This token. It's not something that the client can understand. It's just a, a string of characters uh, that it can use to call the resource server instead. So instead of providing the user's credentials down to the resource server, it now only provides the access token to the resource server. The resource server then needs to know, is this a valid token? So it calls the authorization server, perhaps. This can be done in various ways. And the, the authorization service says, yeah, that's a valid token. It expires in five minutes, and it belongs to this particular user, et cetera. And with that, the resource server starts providing the data requested. That's a simplified OAuth flow. There's a couple more errors in there. But in essence, that's what happens when you, when you use OAuth 2. So one really interesting thing, and one very important thing about this, is that the client, the app, doesn't know anything about the user at this stage. It knows, of course, by looking at the data that it received from the resource server, but that's, that's not really a trustworthy source. So all it had was some sort of opaque token that it sent on to the resource server. And this is usually nice, but in some cases it's pretty useless because what if you're, you're more than an app and you have a backend and you need to create sessions and do more about this, uh, about the user that just logged in. And that's where OpenID Connect comes in, simplified. So we have the same image, we have the resource owner, but the client, we now split it. So we have an app on the phone and we have a backend called mymail.com. So we want to do more than just alert stuff about your inbox. We maybe want to s translate the emails and store them translated for you in, an, I don't know, some, some fancy service. So that means that our server here now needs to access the emails over there, but it also probably needs to create a session between the, the client app and the client backend. And that session probably adds even more information about you uh, because the result of your data is something new. So it needs to know who you are. But still, we don't want to own all the identities. So we start again. The client wants to contact the resource server, but it starts by sending a request to the authorization server. The, the user is challenged and provides its credentials, same as before. The authorization server says, yes, that's fine. And now it responds with the access token and the ID token. And this is what's different. So the ID token is 
an, a token that contains information about the user. So they are used for different purposes. The ID token says stuff like, yes, this user has authenticated. Yes, this user's name is Jane Doe. Yes, this user has an email of this and that. And it also can add a custom amount of claims in there. Um, and what the resource server then does, it uses this ID token to create its own session. And then it passes the access token on to the resource server on the request further on. So the ID token is not really sent away. It's just used for knowing stuff about the user and not having to build your own authentication service and have the users create passwords and stuff in your service, which is useless because they're anyway going to use the other service. And of course, the resource server responds and all the data comes and the sessions are set up and everything is it's peachy. So what was interesting about that? The most interesting part that ID tokens gave us now was trust. They increased the trust between the authorization server or the, the party who issues tokens and the party who relies on the tokens, the client. This trust is now manifested by the ID token. And the ID token is what, what David also mentioned earlier, a JSON web token or a JOT. And the JSON web token is a JSON document, or actually many JSON documents, bunched, uh, piled, compiled together, encoded, and then signed. And it sort of looks like this. You have a, a header, you have a body, both of them are JSON. And then you take a, a certificate or a public key, and you compile, um, you sign this document and get a signature that looks like this, that you append to the, to the message. And that's your, your jot, the signature plus the encoded data. So it's not necessarily encrypted, uh, means you could, you could easily read it. But what's interesting is that all your clients now, they can take the public part of this. I probably said public, I meant you sign it with the private, obviously. You take the public part of this, uh, and then you validate the signature, and you know, okay, the AS actually did sign this and did issue this authentication session. I can trust that. I can now create my own sessions on this. I know that the user has authenticated. That's really interesting. Because JOTs can also be used for access tokens. So we know what, even if we don't use OpenID Connect, we can use JOTs uh, for a lot of things. And it's really like this. There are two types of tokens. We have a by value token, and we have a by reference token. And there's probably more, but these are the two main types that we use. A by reference token is a token that is pretty much like a C++ pointer. It's a string that points to a space somewhere where information is located. So it means nothing to the user outside uh, the AS or the one who stored this information. Uh, it's random. You cannot decode it. You cannot uh, decrypt it. You, you cannot brute force it. It's very hard to do anything with. So it's completely opaque. And this is the standard format of an access token. Um, the AES, on the other hand, they, it can keep a lot of information tied to this. It can say, yeah, it was this user at that time with these claims that could do these things. Um, and it expires at that time. That means that these tokens are fairly safe to send outside your network. They're a good, good match when you're on the internet and want to have a, a mobile client use your access tokens to, to gain access to your, your data. On the other hand, we have the by value tokens. And yeah, you know what that means now. That's a JOT, typically. It contains all the necessary information, or most of the necessary information that we want. So we take all the information, we compile it down, we sign it, and we stick it into the message and use that as an access token. And that is, of course, great because you don't have to call someone to figure out what, it, what this token is. It's not so great because anyone can read it. And even if you encrypt it, you, you sort of expose yourself to, to attempts of decrypting this or, or cracking, cracking your codes. So you don't necessarily want to share this uh, around the internet too much. Um, except between perhaps trusted parties, or sort of trusted parties. So what we usually do then is that we, we split these tokens, or we split the way we use it. 
we say that we have an external world and we have an internal world. So our reference tokens are issued by the authorization server. They are then fired away and, and left with the client. The client sends them back now when it's time to call an API. Then we have someone in the middle who takes this access token, looks it up with the AS and says, oh yeah, this, it's, it's this guy. And the AS responds with a jot instead of just saying valid. So it responds with a jot. And the jot is then passed further on in the network. So we essentially create a token translation point. And it's, it's not really more than that. It can be a full-fledged API firewall, but it could also be just a reverse proxy or some step on the way in your network, but typically on the edge. And it can cache these things. It doesn't have to be stateful at all more than that. Um, and that's it. So let's go back to microservices now then. So we had two initial problems. We had to identify the user, and we had to create sessions, more or less. So first, obviously, what I'm trying to get at is leave the authentication and identification to the OAuth and OpenID Connect server. Don't bother with it. Your microservices, all they do is provide access, given that somebody has the right to, to ask for it. But more importantly, let all microservices consume jots. These jots, as I said, contained all the necessary information that we needed. If each of these services can understand a JSON web token, then you have distributed your authentication mechanism. You have it somewhere else, and you have a way of transporting identity information between your system. They can send this back and forth between, between them, and it doesn't really change. It's not, an, it's not a request object anymore. It's uh, an identity object that you pass around. Building a JOT understanding library is, is a very small task. It can easily be, easily be included in all of these uh, when you deploy them. So all you do is ask them to understand a JOT. Obviously, what I've been trying to say is you probably should translate this. So have some guy in the front, stateless, not have to do much, but all it has to do is take the re by reference token and convert it to a by value token, and then shoot this into your network. So that's, that's my talk on, on OAuth and microservices. And what I've tried to say here is that by using Jot, we get a self-contained solution. You can easily replicate this in every service. All they need to do is accept this token on the incoming uh, path. It's completely standards-based, it's secure, and it's highly scalable. All right. Thank you.